Okay, so today we're covering the eternal security of the believers. And um, well, I wanted to print out this before I left the house and I forgot, so I have to read it from my phone. <laughs> if, uh, if you see me squinting. Uh, first of all, so uh, I wanted to talk about security from what or who? So God provides security from sin, from the world, and from Satan. Uh, from sin, you can read, uh, I'm, there's a lot of passages, so I'm not going to go over everything. First John 1, 9, what he says, uh, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins if we, if we confess our sins. And um, from the world, uh, he has overcome the world. There's many passages on that. And uh, from Satan, uh, First Peter can, uh, describes Satan as a roaring lion, looking for who he could devour. So obviously, we need protection from, from all, all of these. Now, um, the other thing I was going to say is security of the believers. So this is security of our souls. Uh, you may hear a lot of unsaved people say things like, oh yeah, I know this guy, he's a Christian and he's always sick and he's always having this problem, depression. You know, all these things that you would think God would protect somebody from. But the main thing is God is protecting our souls. So our bodies may have suffering or, or uh, you know, God chooses different reasons why he lets us go through the experiences we go through. You know, I could think of um, Joseph in the Old Testament. You know, everything recorded about him is he was doing right. And then uh, Potiphar's wife goes and uh, seduces him. And he just takes off running. He's like, oh my goodness, I can't do this against God. He does the right thing at the right time, with the right motives, and he gets in trouble anyways. And, you know, God has his reasons for it. Later on, we see he went to jail. He spent many years in jail. And, you know, eventually he's a ruler of Egypt. God may have wanted him to gain experiences there so he can uh, be the second in command of Egypt. Whatever the case, uh, sometimes he uses sickness, sometimes he, he uses bad things to bring us back to him. But obviously, you know, our bodies, our, our life here on earth is not what, uh, what, what most people would consider protected from God. You, you know, some people, uh, it may seem like everything goes great. Some Christians, they never have a hard time, you know, whatever the case is. But even the Bible told, tells us that we will have tribulations. So that's the other thing I wanted to mention is the security of our souls. So our souls are secure. Um, God will, you know, protect us from sin, from the world, from Satan. Satan would love to devour us and make us fall into sin and, you know, all the pitfalls that, that come from sin. But... Our souls are protected, and and that's what we're going to talk about is is how. So the the main title for today: eternal security of self of believers. So eternal is from the point we uh, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. So uh, last week, uh, Patrick uh, covered the one of self. Uh, the part of the we believe in, of salvation. So once we are saved from that point on to the rest of eternity, our souls are protected. So there's nothing that can happen that would that that would happen that we would not go to heaven. And uh, so who provides the security? You know that's the main thing is usually when you go to a store or, you know, a bank or something, you see a security guard there, you see a show of force and makes you feel secure. 
especially sometimes if you go to a high crime area and you see a policeman, you feel like, oh yeah, let me stick around this area. At least there's a policeman there. So that's very important. So God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are providing the security for us. First of all, God the Father laid out the plan of salvation, including many Old Testament prophecies. Uh, there's a, a whole list of prophecies. Um, you know, if you, if you read the first few chapters of, uh, of Luke, you just read, you know, to fulfill this prophecy, to fulfill that prophecy, to fulfill it, you know, and you could just keep, you know, we, we don't have much time, but many prophecies. There, there is probably no conspiracy, no, no conspirators that could possibly have passed down through generations for all these prophecies to be fulfilled. You know, first it had to be from the lineage of David. Then when David's um, when the kingly lineage sinned, God said, that's it. Nobody else from this lineage is going to rule. And um, God made it so that it was still the, um, the lineage of David through another line. And then Joseph, the kingly line. And then eventually Joseph adopted Jesus because he was born of a virgin. It, you know, uh, Joseph wasn't Jesus' biological father. So that way he fulfilled the prophecy that he was of the seed of David and also the lineage of the, the royal lineage of, of Israel. Uh, you know, that's just one example. Uh, another example, like, um, like Dr. Cohen said, nobody famous came from Bethlehem. So, so God said he's going to be born in Bethlehem. How could it be possible that nobody else famous came from Bethlehem? That could only be God. Um, so, so God the Father laid out the, uh, the plan of salvation. And he sent the Son. So then Jesus, the Son, had to live a sinless life. So he came here for 33 years. No one was able to find any fault in him. They pointed little things out about the Sabbath. But most of those were like rules that the... Um, uh, that the Pharisees came up with. Uh, there was no sin. And even at the end, uh, Pontius Pilate declared him innocent. But he said, you know, I'm going to hand him over to be crucified because of the Jews, not because he found any fault in him. Um, he, he, you know, even on the cross, you know, like things that he couldn't have controlled, like he's hanging on the cross. There's a prophecy that his garments were going to be gambled for. How could he have controlled that? How could anybody have controlled it? It had to be those Roman soldiers that were right there that decided to do that. And, um, you know, and, and like the hymn says, our Jesus did all things well. And because of his, how he did everything well, he's able to be the perfect sacrifice for our sins so it's not like in the old testament where the blood of bulls and bulls and goats was used to postpone uh, the sin until or cover up the sin until jesus could come and die on the cross he actually he was a perfect sacrifice so he could forgive us of our sins and um and last week, we, we brought up how uh, the wages of sin is death. So Jesus had to die for our sins. And then God, the Holy Spirit, protects us in the way that we are indwelled at salvation. Um, in Acts, we had to wait till Acts 2 for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And then later on, we hear how the apostles place their hands on the believers and they receive the Holy Spirit. But now uh, from salvation, we're indwelled by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gives us, he uh, gives us confidence of our salvation. He, uh, he leads us and guides us. So many times when we're praying, 
for, you know, to feel God's presence. The Holy Spirit can comfort us. And, and actually in John, uh, that's what he's called. He's called the comforter. And uh, later on, I'm going to read that passage. But it's interesting how, you know, usually if you, 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 you see it now, you call a bank or you call somebody, and all you always you get this automated machine. You know, you love to talk to a person, and, and you got to go through a bunch of hoops and uh, to actually talk to a person. So when Jesus was here in, in person, the disciples loved that. They they had a person that they could talk to, they could see, they could feel, they could eat with, and um, and you, and in those chapters in John, I. Would, I've read him several times, and uh, he's he's comforting them. He he's, he starts off by uh, let not your heart be troubled. You know, like John fourteen verse one, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. So he's here encouraging them he knew they were going to suffer when they saw him dying on the cross and this was a back and forth it wasn't like him sitting here preaching he was you know then thomas interrupts him and says lord we do not know where you're going then phillips later on interrupts him show us the father and it suffices us you know and he goes oh my goodness haven't you seen me you know uh i am in the father let me just read that. Have you been with me so long in, in verse 9 of chapter 14? And yet you have not known me, Philip. How he who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I speak to you do not speak on my own authority, but the authority who dwells in me and the works believe me. Sorry. <laughs> Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. So... He's answering all the questions. Later on, Judas, not Iscariot, asks another question. Then he talks about the true vine. So he's constantly here just going through three chapters, preparing them. And then in chapter 16, he starts talking about how he has to, how he's going to have to leave and uh, the comforter is going to come. So in, in verse 20 of chapter 17, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may be one as you are, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given to them, that they may be one just as we are one. So here he's praying for us. He's saying others are going to believe. It's not just the disciples. It's not just the nation of Israel. It's, uh, you know, others. And, and that includes us. And, um, and the promise that God did to David is, Someone's going to rule for all eternity from his line. So, so this is Jesus. Right now, he's not ruling. He's, you know, we're still waiting for the second coming. But, um, but he will rule. He he is protecting us. And um, and he spent a lot of time comforting the the disciples because. He knew how they were going to feel. All of a sudden, this person that they've been with for three years, they've been eating with, traveling with, you know, 
all the different things you do with a friend, uh, having a relationship with, is going to be gone. They're going to see him die a brutal death. So he, he spent a good amount of time comforting them and talking about the comfort of it. And, and then later on uh, in Acts 2, so he told them, do not leave Jerusalem right away. So in Acts 2, that's when the, the Holy Spirit comes down. It was a miraculous sign of, it looked like tongues of fire, uh, tongues of fire descending. And the apostles were, were filled with the Holy Spirit. And you could tell by how, you know, when like Peter denied Jesus three times right before the cross. After that, when he was filled with the Holy Spirit, he was willing to be sacrificed uh, instead of denying Jesus or trying to hide it. He was boldly proclaiming the gospel. So, um, so this security of believers is also known as assurance of salvation. And um, other um, things that some people may call it is once saved, always saved. Um, when we're first born, we're slaves to sin. We have no power over sin. Eventually, uh, you know, maybe some people are better than others. It may take longer to sin, but eventually we're all going to sin and we're going to do it over and over and over. Now, with the Holy Spirit, we do have power over sin. Unfortunately, some people still uh, fall into sin for, you know, whatever reason. Uh, Again, I could use the example of David. Um, but still, like the Bible says, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. It's not like, oh, okay, you were saved at salvation. You, all your past sins were forgiven. You know, now if you sin again, that's it. You're, you're not saved anymore. That's not true. We are saved uh, forever. And, uh, you know, John 3.16 is a perfect example. It says eternal life. It doesn't say life until you know, the next time you fall into sin. And the other thing that uh, was, you know, it seems like uh, some people that are saved later on in life, sometimes they go through a lot of sin or they had different situations in their life. And when they believe in the Lord Jesus, it's a drastic change. It's a 180. And they have this feeling that they know they're saved because they see the change in their life. Sometimes people at a young age are saved and they're innocent and there's not really that big of a change. It's not that drastic. So sometimes there's this, um, this problem with assurance of salvation. But again, I go back to the Holy Spirit in dwellings. If we have a relationship with the Holy Spirit, if for any reason we don't have a full assurance, we can always pray to God and God will give us the assurance. Through the Holy Spirit, we, we, would, be, we would be sure. We, you know, um, it, assurance of salvation is very important. Sometimes you see people that they live a godly life. Everybody thinks they're Christian. They fall away and then they say, oh, look, he lost his salvation. It could be he never was saved. It could be he was deceiving people. It could be he's still saved, but he's just living in sin. But, you know, we just don't know. It's basically between God and the person. Uh, so that's important to know. You know, salvation is a very important aspect of, uh, of our our being so it's important to know that we are saved and it's important to um, to have the assurance so we should all we should pray and with the relationship with the holy spirit with the relationship with god with the reading the word the holy spirit can lead us to passages that will make us be sure and uh the Another uh, passage I wanted to read, for some reason, I'm not sure if I have it. I don't have it bookmarked, but uh, um, uh, John 10, 27, uh, verse 27. And, and here we see 
it doesn't talk about the Holy Spirit, but it does talk about God the Father and God the Son. And this is one of the most important passages of uh, security of the believer. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than I, than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. And I and my Father are one. So basically, we're inside Jesus' hand. Uh, already, that's difficult for anybody to snatch them out of that. Then, in, on top of it, we're inside God's hand. We double security. And then we're involved by the Holy Spirit, triple security. So we're completely protected. And, and like it says here, eternal life. Uh, sometimes some people, and I'm not sure where this comes from, believe that a person can decide to not be saved anymore. And that's not true because we were bought by a price. We were bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. So before we were slaves to sin, now we're slaves to God. And Peter and Paul, and Peter and, uh, yeah, Peter and Paul uh, call themselves in certain epistles, bond servants. I think in uh, Philippians at, at the beginning, uh, bond servant of Jesus Christ. And Peter also, uh, calls himself bond servant and through the epistles different ones different words are used um, servant and it's it's strange if you look through the greek sometimes it says uh servant but the meaning is slave or or other uses of the same word are a slave so basically you know we're not our own we were bought with a price just like a slave was wasn't able to do whatever he wanted to you know in slave times we're not able to do what we wanted eventually if we do decide to commit a sin or something god will have uh, consequences for us now that doesn't mean we lose our salvation there's consequences to all sin and uh you know it's like uh as if you go through fire, if all of a sudden that door was on fire and and we had to get out of here, you could just run through the door, you catch a little bit of fire, you, you know, you clean yourself off and you're safe, you're outside, you, you know, you're in the fresh air, but you went through fire, you know, it's not like it killed you or, so that's, uh, that's salvation. Sometimes if we don't live a godly life, if we fall into sin, we're going to go through trial and tribulation on here on earth and uh, and we will be judged but we, we will still go to heaven and that's eternal salvation of the security of the security of the, of the believer and um you know another thing i was i was looking at the back you know this is like one of the most important things in this whole we believe but it's down in the bottom and the reason it's in the bottom is because it builds on all of these. You know, if you don't have the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you don't have the personality of the Holy Spirit, the eternal existence of three persons, the Father, the Son, if somebody came and filled you up with a bunch of words of, oh yeah, you know, I'll, you're saved because of this and that or, or whatever. It's just one person speaking. This is God through his word. And then, you know, the other thing that uh, Abraham covered we need to know that this is a word of God. You know, it's important. So, so that's why it builds on this. And so we're down in the bottom here about the eternal security believers building on all these other things that 